Welcome, everybody. My name is Mikey Mhenna. Nice to see you here. I'm the executive director of Afrika, calling in from Beirut. My special guest is Professor Suja Sawafta, who is an assistant professor of Arabic studies in the Department of Modern Languages and Literatures at the University of Miami. Her research focuses on exile, um, exo criticism at the Franco Arab intersection. She's currently working on her first book project, which examines the impact of exile, intellectual commitment, and political dissent in the works of formative Saudi Iraqi novelist Abdul Rahman Munif. She teaches interdisciplinary content courses on literature and cinema, as well as Arabic and French language. Suja, welcome to our Victor Conversations. Thank you for having me, Mikey. It's a pleasure to be here. It is a pleasure. It's fun. It's great to talk to you. Um, so I want to talk about where you are calling from right now. You currently, you, you live in Miami, which I'm jealous of. I love Miami. But you're calling from North Carolina, the state that accepted me in 2003 as a young college student at the age of 17. Um, I have fond memories of North Carolina. Is that where you grew up? Mostly, yes. So I was born in Indiana um, to Palestinian parents. And then we moved to New York, where I lived till I was about eight. So from eight onwards, I would say to on and off between eight and 31, I was here. And then most recently, Miami. So <laughs> I would say North Carolina is the closest to home or a home base that I have. Yeah. And as a kid, um, you were immediately drawn to Arabic literature um, or not at all? I assume not at all, but am I, should I be surprised? Um, not really, actually. That's a, that's a good question because I think the genesis of all of this started when I was a child. Uh, you only really understand this in retrospect, right? So I think just in the last few years, I've been trying to kind of understand how I got to this point. Um, and I think my parents did a really good job of kind of making sure that, you know, my Palestinian heritage and the, and the Levantine culture was part of every single week. You know, the weekends were just for Fayruz and Zafar and teaching Arabic and religion. Um, so it was, I grew up with that being a very natural part of my upbringing and my identity. So I never felt like a conflict between being American and being Arab. I would say primarily I felt always that I was Palestinian and then secondary was the American identity. But um, I think the thing that actually drew me to literature was 9-11 out of all things. Because I was 13 um, when that happened and I was really... I, I have no other language to describe that time other than it being electrically painful. And I think the reason that I say that is because like so many others who were forced to come, come of age during this time, um, it was almost as if by overnight with these three elements of the second intifada, 9-11, uh, and then the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan, every aspect of everything I knew to be my identity and home was under attack. Um, and so I would seek refuge in literature, but it wasn't Arabic literature, it was um, Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, you know, the works of C.S. Lewis, so a lot of fantasy and historical fiction, um, which I think subconsciously actually was the seedling that led me to Oxford, because I was looking up where all of these authors that I really loved and were giving me so much comfort went to school and or worked and many of them were Oxford graduates. So I think I made that decision that that was going to be in my future when I was a child. Um, but then, you know, I think as part of the natural defense mechanism of having to be the poster child in my class, pretty much my entire teenage life. Where in North uh, Carolina, where are you? Greensboro, Greensboro, North Carolina. <laughs> Yeah. I was like, well, I'm having to do this work on the defensive anyway, let me make it my job. So I married the two together after that point. Were you, I mean, I, I assume the initial sort of entry point into Arab literature was Palestinian literature to begin with, in, in particular. Palestinian and Algerian. I was really drawn to resistance and revolutionary literature. And I think through exploring sort of, I have the language for it now, but when I was, you know, that young, I didn't really know that this was anti-colonial or, um, you know, I didn't have that, that type of understanding of what it actually was, what type of work it was. But I was drawn to people who were writing about resisting and surviving um, unbearable violence. And so that was sort of my gateway into, into the, the literary world, the Arabic literary world. Yeah. So um, 
your your scholarship as a, as a doctoral student was focused on the image um, that we see here. And I'm really, really curious, the people on the chat or the people watching the video later, if how many people could actually identify the face of that man? Um, my suspicion is not many, even though he is um, among critics lauded as you know the most prominent. I actually have the quote. Um, in an interview you gave, you said he's considered to be the the formative pan Arabist intellectual of the 20th century. Um, I, I don't have the quote here, but Edward Said in a review lauded his work as saying you know it's a um, a giant of literature, uh, a, gi a gigantic feat of literature. He's a big deal. Why do fewer people, why do few English speaking people who care about the Arab world know who this person is? And who is this person? This is Abdurrahman Munif. I'll start there with the man himself. Um, and he was a Jordanian born Saudi Iraqi petroleum economist and novelist. Um, I think the main, I, I should, say this, I should preface this by saying in the Arab world, he's widely celebrated and yeah. widely known and canonical. Um, for whatever reason, I think because he hasn't been translated into English and he's been translated into French and some other quote unquote Western languages. Um, so he's, he's well known in France, for example. Um, and he's, people are coming to know him in the Spanish speaking world as well. Um, but because so few of his formative works have been translated into English and the ones that have been translated into English didn't really do very well. Um, they weren't the types of literature that, you know, English speakers wanted to read about the Arab world, let's say. Um, he hasn't really until very recently made it into the discussion. That's starting to change. I would say in the last 10 years, there's been more and more conversation about Yeah, him. I think so. So, um, you you put a you said a few like words very very quickly in quick succession. Mm -hmm. um, oil economic econ, uh, economist, journalist, writer, thinker, cultural critic, novelist, um, Saudi Iraqi. There's a lot of things that he is. So set the scene. So this guy was born in 1933 in Jordan, um, and he spent the first 20 years of his life kind of in a, a bunch of different places. What's the world that he was born into? So um, he was the son of a Saudi tradesman, uh, a Bedouin Saudi tradesman from the Nejd region. And he was born in Jordan. By the time he was born, his father had already passed. Uh, but his siblings who were older than him, I would say identified primarily as Syrian because they spent a lot of time in the Levantine sort of cultural context. Um, and he, he was raised by two matriarchal figures, his grandmother and his mother. And he came of age basically in the World War II era of Amman in its nascent stages um, as a capital. And, um, and sort of, you know, it being very um, transnational, but not in the, you know, not in the capitalist globalist sense that we understand that to be today, like Dubai or, you know, um, you know, another kind of like Singapore or something, but more so like any Ottoman city would have been very transnational and sort of like a highway. Um, he was directly impacted according to his uh, biographical work. It's not an autobiography because he frames it as uh, a biography of a city. It's called Sirit Medina, Amman fil Arbenat, or Story of a City Amman in the 1940s. He says that at that time he was being uh, kind of observant of some of the political happenings. And one of the main things was the loss of Palestine and sort of the political conversations that were taking place in this very heightened colonial context. He grew up kind of seeing British colonial figures uh, parade around Jordan, and he kind of took notes at that early age. So his coming of age or his political awareness really began when he was a child. And he lived in Amman until he was about 17 or 18. Um, and at that time, he says that he felt very out of place. So similar in the way that Edward Said talk, talks about being out of place in Cairo as a Palestinian, a, a very Anglophile, Anglophone Palestinian in, in Cairo. Um, Munif speaks very similarly, but rather than it being you know, a foreign language that kind of occupied his mind, it was mostly a different dialect. So he felt most at home speaking in Iraqi Arabic with his grandmother. 
but he knew that she stuck out like a sore thumb. And so he kind of inherited her alienation and was aware that, yes, I grew up here, I was born here, but I'm not from here. Um, and I would say that that kind of plagued him until he was about 17, 18, where he moved to Iraq to study law. But he was um, exiled to finish his university degree in Cairo, I think, in 1955. Um, and then he went on to Belgrade to pursue a PhD in petroleum economics. So there's a lot of little things behind the machine here that are all taking place at the same time. But it sort of it stems from that childhood feeling of alienation. So, so he becomes a, that's really, really helpful. So he goes to Belgrade, he becomes a, um, a he gets a PhD in oil economics. Um, is this begrudgingly or is, do you have a sense that he's like, oh, I, I guess I got to do this is the only way to make money? Or is he actually turned on by this type of thinking? He understands, um, he understands the sort of, the, the curve, he sort of sees the curve coming so this is in the early 50s, um, or, or late 50s, early 60s. So um, oil production has really already taken, taken shape and is, there, is pumping quite, quite literally. So he understands this, this is the burgeoning industry. Is he excited about this? Or is he like, Ugh, I guess is the only way I got to make money? <laughs> I think that's a really good question. My understanding of it is that he saw it as the golden resource. He was very much aware of it being sort of, um, the region's ticket to modernity and sort of a way of being liberated from the colonial economic system that had been very much entrenched in, in all of the Arab world. Um, and I haven't read anything that explicitly states this, that he's written. He's written a lot of essays about, you know, his technocratic work or his, you know, his work in oil. But I think he was really interested in questions of development, specifically in the post-colonial context. And oil having been sort of the resource of the age and the one that is also very abundant um, in both of his, his fatherland and his motherland, I think he sees the opportunity to make a political difference by using oil as um, the, his area of expertise. That being said, I think that, you know, he, he kind of went into it uh, very much a leftist, kind of enamored with the early Ba'athist ideology of revolution and, and liberation. And so he wanted to be actively involved in this post-colonial moment. And this was, I think, the way he felt that he could most make a difference. But it became very obvious very quickly with the rise of these personality cults um, across the region that the revolutionary ideology that they had sort of co-opted wasn't really what was translating on the ground. And so that leads us to kind of his next era of work. Okay, so um, keep going, you're doing great. So yeah, okay. the next you want era of work, on? yeah, no, where he's, I wanna where get to it. Yeah. Okay, just keep going. So <laughs> I was like, do you wanna great. follow? <laughs> no, so I mean- No, you're doing great. Until about 1970, he was pretty much involved as a political advisor to, yeah. uh, to you know the Hussein, the Saddam Hussein government, the you know the Assad government. So the, I think Syria and Iraq were the primary places that he was involved as a as a technocrat in these, yeah. and they kind of are brought together by by their Baathist ideology. So what very, I, yeah. What I didn't get from uh, the preparation for this was how up the ladder as a advisor was he? Um, was he sitting at the table? Was he at the sort of in the bleachers around the table? Um, walk, I mean, so, was his, it was his departure hugely felt in those circles. Like, well, like I can't believe he, he's criticizing us publicly. Like, the sense that we get is that he was up there, but I wouldn't say, you know, among, you know, the, the closest in the cabinet because he was a technocrat. So he yeah. had one foot in sort of the popular sphere and then one foot in the in the political yeah. um but because he had been kind of started his career writing in journals um and writing specifically about oil and the role that this could play in the region's liberation from neoliberalism from colonialism and kind of as sort of the catalyst that can that can really bring about the change that people were were craving um i think it became very evident pretty early on that 
he was very much engaged and wasn't willing to sell out to line his own pockets. So his, his departure actually comes at a time when just after 1967, there had been this sort of call to radicalization of Arabic literature and cultural production after you know, more and more of Palestine had been lost uh, to Israel in the Arab defeat of the Nexa or the Hazima, whatever you wanna call it. Um, and so I think a lot of people were starting to question their roles, whether it was political or whether it was cultural um, and intellectual. And so on the intellectual front, we have artists, art, you know, visual artists, sculpt sculptors, novelists saying, okay, actually producing aesthetic work at this stage isn't sufficient, we have to radicalize um, cultural production. And it comes at a time when Ghassan Kenefani had kind of published a call to arms that said, listen, let's take this to the next step. Munif was directly impacted by this. And uh, he joined a, basically a camp of intellectuals. He left sort of the, the technocratic development world and joined the camp of intellectuals in Baghdad at the time who called themselves SCSEUN. So the political ones. And they were a younger generation of radical leaning um, intellectuals and artists who had come after a generation of esthetes and dandies. Uh, his mentor, Jabra Ibrahim Jabra, uh, was the one who actually um, encouraged him to leave politics for, for no, uh, to write novels. He said, listen, you can do actually much more good by becoming a novelist, because if your goal is to reach the average citizen, then what good is the work you're going to be doing with these dictators? Just start writing. So he transitions from politics and publishes his first novel in 1970. But is it comes a, at, yeah. Is this a form, before you keep on going, is this a form and sort of a medium that he's familiar with at the time where he's like, oh yeah, novels, I love novels. Not really, no. <laughs> so, yeah, so on one hand, he's accepting this, this form medium yeah. and saying this in order to find popularity and find an audience. I, you know, it's interesting because I think it was really a thirst for being intellectual, uh, being politically committed. And so the question was, how best can I do that? More so than chasing celebrity or anything of that nature. He was um, a very eloquent and very well published writer, but more so in journalistic and uh, journalistic work, essays and development pieces, like sort mm -hmm. of like development reports. So the switch to, to, to novelism or writing novels wasn't a complete departure, but I think in terms of the aesthetic approach and the narratology, obviously he had to, it was a new, it, it was a newer world. And he always, he, he used to refer to the novel as a world that required um, umarasa practice. Um, and that it was something that he had to become familiar with, but that it didn't feel completely foreign to him in terms of, you know, was it accessible or not? I think that he, it, it, after a couple of novels, he felt very comfortable. And when you compare his work, his early work to say early, not, early Arabic novels in general, actually the, the voice that he has as a, as a narrator was much more confident and um, secure than a lot of the earlier novels in, in the Arabic tradition because Arab writers were still trying to figure out if the novel was an acceptable form for Arabic literature. When we're coming from yeah. the Qasida, we're coming from poetry. So I think he had a quick, you know, the learning curve was quick for him. It wasn't necessarily a painful process. So maybe we could talk about this. Uh, this It's a novel, I believe, right? The World Without Maps, yeah. Yeah. Um, which he co-wrote with uh, Jabra Ibrahim Jabra, uh, who's like part mentor, part um, colleague, um, and then we'll, we'll get into Cities of Salt. Um, so what is sort of the influence of, of this book and how did it lead into some of his later work? So the interesting thing about Jabra Ibrahim Jabra as a character, I think I should say before um, I yeah. delve right into this, is that Jabra is actually the how I found Munif. I had taken a course at UNC during my master's on um, dissident voices in Arabic literature. And Jabra was kind of praised as sort of, you know, without using absolutes too much, you know, the intellectual model that many, specifically many post-Lebanese Civil War writers were trying to debunk. This idea of like, 
an enigmatic intellectual who had a lot of mystique and women wanted him and men wanted to be him. And he had a lot of social capital because this figure was in exile and um, Jevra specifically modeled his protagonist a lot after himself. So there were a lot of his characters, the, the main characters always shared some qualities with Jabra. Um, but Jabra was a Palestinian um, intellectual who very Kafka-like found himself exiled by accident in, in 1948. He was in pursuit of work in Beirut or Damascus. Uh, and because of sort of the Nakba, he wasn't really welcomed anywhere until he reached um, the Iraqi border where he says he opens a suitcase and he offers the, the official, um, basically his paintings and his books and his brushes and all these things. Um, and it was because of that, that he was allowed entry into Iraq where he went on to become uh, the Renaissance man or one of, you know, one of the central figures, the new vanguards that revitalized um, the scene in Iraq in the 1950s, uh, which, you know, was part of, you know, the second Renaissance. So Jabra as a figure was really central to this intellectual awakening and was seen as one of the main Palestinian intellectual figures who cemented sort of the idea of, you know, so there were many other Palestinians who were kind of like spreading around, but he kind of cemented that like image of this very attractive, very intelligent, um, very elite Shakespeare, Shakespeare reciting um, figure in the Arab world. So because of that, um, he was very much an esthete. He loved to wear suits. He loved art. He loved to discuss things in salons. And so I think much of that social capital was very much tied to the fact that he could actually keep up the image. And I, I don't think it was something he was doing kind of superficially. I think it was just truly who he believed that he was on an intrinsic level. And so he was, you know, he's Cambridge and Harvard educated. He was among the first to translate Shakespeare into Arabic. So he was very much, you know, top tier ivory tower intellectual type of figure. Um, and but after 1967, when the change in the conversation about, you know, is, be, is doing or creating aesthetic beautiful work enough when people, when more and more of the land is being lost, um, he came into conflict with like his position and he wrote the first book that kind of challenged his previous notions, which is Al-Bahth an Walid Masoud. Where that plays into this book, Alam Bila Kharait, is that Jabra was not only Munif's mentor, but they also kind of firmly stood on opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of the role of the intellectual and which, which one had it right and which one had it wrong, right? So they still were very close and they still loved each other and had a very uh, strong relationship. But one of the things they did was they came together to co-author this novel, um, A World Without Maps, where the central protagonist is a novelist who's writing a novel about the role of the novelist in society. So you have a labyrinth. Yeah. And they're trying to answer that question of the debate of, you know, is it aesthetics versus politics? Do we need to be dandy intellectuals or do we need to be revolutionary in the trenches with the people? They don't reach a conclusion at the end, but they try to marry their work together in this collaborative piece. And I think if a memory serves me correctly, it's one out of four known co-written novels in the 20th century by two intellectuals. In any language? In Arabic. Okay, I was gonna say. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so I wanna, I wanna get to City of Salt, which is the, the books that I would imagine most people know um, when they think of Munif. Um, so there, it's, a, it's a series of five books um, and they are about an unnamed place. Um, would you say that these books are about oil? That's a good question because oil doesn't make a physical presence in the yeah. novels, but they're definitely about the history of oil extraction in the, in the Middle East yeah. um, and sort of the rise of this neoliberal structure in the Khalij that we know today. Um, hence the title Cities of Salt or Modern Al-Milh, which talk about these sort of unsustainable 
very glamorous but unsustainable cities that if oil were to disappear would not be able to you know maintain their presence so i think what's really interesting about specifically the first um the first one which is translated in english as cities of salt um but the whole series is called cities of salt so it's, it's like a little bit difficult to switch between the arabic and the english at times it's, it's basically a revised social history of Saudi Arabia, or let's say the Arabian Peninsula in general, um, where he takes sort of the, the narrative and the myths surrounding, you know, the Saud dynasty and all the other sheikhs in the region and their kind of involvement in modernizing the Arabian Peninsula and kind of turns it on its head because he places it from the perspective of the Bedouin who are ecologically committed their natives. So it's the same, it's the same way that we would be reading about, you know, um, Native Americans today or Palestinians who are losing their lands, who are farmers, or you know, people in Latin America. It's that same type of native being indigenous, uh, being connected to the land versus the settler uh, colonial figure that has no understanding of the land other than its functional utility. Like what can I extract from this place by way of resources? So then the series is interesting because at least in the first one, you know, it's set from the perspective of the natives who are mourning basically the loss of Bedouin life. And they're basically dragooned into um, becoming the same figures that have to put on the factory um, outfits and build basically the oil refinery in the Haran. Uh, Although he doesn't, he he calls it another. He calls it Hadarat. So, so everything has a different name, but it's it's basically an anagram like uh, reference, or just by reading. Munif does this a lot. He he creates a fictional setting, but it's always often modeled after a real city or a real place. Um, so so that's what's so interesting about Cities of Salt is that it's like the social history of you know the oil industry, the rise of the oil industry, who the victims of it were. And it kind of shows also that the native Bedouin tribes of this area or this region were actually actively involved in revolutionary tactics to reclaim their way of life um, from the oil industry's tycoons. Uh, which is something that has kind of been buried in today's understanding of, you know, how these countries were modernized from, say, you know, the 30s to the, the 70s and 80s, and even into the 90s. Uh, but, but it ties, kind of subliminally, it ties the arrival of these figures, basically the first foreign engineers, sometimes they're referred to as Americans and sometimes they're referred to as Franks. So he uses a lot of crusader metaphors. Um, they've come, it starts at the point when they've come to the Arabian Peninsula right after um, they went to Iran and Iraq and then you know, arrived to the shores of um, the Eastern part of Saudi Arabia basically. So that's where it starts. And okay, so We'll we'll get to back to some of the, um, the the like broader sort of social commentary, but it's written in a specific way that is also um, noteworthy. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, of course. So one of the things that I think makes you, uh, Monif a unique figure is that he really sought to. Um, to create an accessible register for his readership. He didn't want um, his novels to be convoluted or use very um, sophisticated, inaccessible fusha. He tried really to find a medium between whatever the amiya of the place that he was writing about or referring to is and a fusha. Um, and so it was part of also his social activism to, to kind of break open um, the stereotype that novelists only write for other, you know, ivory tower um, type, type of figures. So the novel itself, the narrator speaks in a very, you know, accessible fusha, and then the dialogue um, between the characters actually attempts to mimic the Bedouin register of the Sharqiya, uh, the, the Sharqiya part of um, uh, Al Mantaka Sharqiya of Saudi Arabia. He says later on, reflecting on this, that he tried his best. He doesn't think that it was um, sufficient in the end, the, the exercise. 
uh, he said it, it somewhat captured the essence of the Bedouin dialect, but that there were some holes. If he could go back and change it, he would. Uh, but he does this in every novel. So even in the novel with Jabra Ibrahim Jabra, that specific novel, as I mentioned earlier, was about the role of the novelist specifically in that Baghdad Renaissance era. So a lot of the dialogue that is used among the characters is a mix between Iraqi Arabic and Levantine Arabic to reflect sort of the nature of the, of, you know, I think in a way to bring pieces of the novelists themselves into it, but also to reflect the nature of like the high society that was, that was kind of on the scene at the time. So that's something that is kind of basically in all of the novels he's written, there's that semblance of using authentic language, Amiya, and then Fusha, and trying to merge yeah. the two into a middle language. Is that completely lost in the translated version? Is it impossible to capture? Yes. <laughs> There's no way in, of really rendering that um, unless you try to, you know, translate in slang. But even then, it doesn't, it doesn't really do the same. It doesn't have the same zest, you know? And I guess the only other way would, to be, would be to say in a footnote, you know, she said in her Iraqi dialect or, you know, that yeah. kind of thing. So, uh, so that's completely lost in the translation. Aside from it actually uh, maybe appealing to, for, I guess maybe before I ask this question, how popular was this book? I mean, was this widely read or these books, were they widely read when they first came out? And do you think part of the success of that um, was, is attributable to the fact that it was written in a specific register that maybe was more popular or more accessible popularly? I think, well, they were very successful and very popular, um, so much so that they were actually banned in Saudi Arabia and, and they were considered so dangerous and so potent that his um, Saudi passport was revoked. Um, and it was only restored after his death, but his children and his wife declined um, the offer. This novel or this series actually was published serially in a newspaper. Um, so people, you know, audiences were getting bits by bits um, of, of sort of this work. And so they were able to like grow and mature and wait for it. I would say the English translation, partly because the translation is not, sorry to the translator, <laughs> the translation isn't really that good. Um, but also I think that the, the type of, you know, what it was saying was so anti-imperialist that you know, American readers, let's say, wanted like an Arab Western and what they got was, look at how you ruined this way of life. It was basically a thud. So only the, the first three were translated into English, but that's also part of the fact that Random House only agreed to publish a trilogy. Um, and then by the time, you know, the trilogy was published in English, Monif said, I actually, it's gonna be a quintet. And they said, thanks, but no thanks. We're not going to <laughs> actually invest more time and money into it. And I would say, yes, like if you can read this in Arabic, this is the work to read in Arabic. I, I, it's still interesting in English, but a lot of the essence and the magic of, of this series is, is lost um, in the translation. So there's still, I mean, I think even today, you know, they're still widely popular it was recently adapted into an opera in London, uh, I think in 2015 by the Royal Opera House. People are coming back and revisiting this and understanding this series as um, a, a, a you know, set of works that were really ahead of their time that were, you know, they were eco-criticism before that field really existed. You know, so there's a lot to say about that. So I, I wanna talk about the idea of eco-criticism because, um, there's this uh, there's this thing that he's struggling with, right? Where it's hard to be anti-development, right? It's hard to be anti-progress. Um, instinctually, any you know, if you go to any five-year-old, they're like trying to like level up constantly. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I heard you say um, in an interview he was he's not anti-modernization, he's pro-modernization, but in a way that's organic to the um, Arab way of life. And, and maybe even if I were to edit that, I feel like you were also saying in organic to the way of life in the Arab world, right? Mm -hmm. And so organic to life period. Yes. Um, and how does, how does he think, or how, how does he suggest 
we were, you know, oil was supposed to be extracted from the, uh, from the ground and how, and were these sort of societies supposed to be built up? Um, does he articulate that in the books or does he just point out uh, the ways in which it was done incorrectly? So that's a really great question. And I think there's two things, there's two elements or there's two sides to it. Um, the first is that the eco-critical or you know, the environmental side of things basically takes the space of where he had previously been blatantly political in other works, right? So in his, in his previous works, the central protagonist was often an intellectual who was an exile, who was a political dissident and was tortured in prison, et cetera. So not unlike his own lived experience, but there came a point, um, I think in the mid eighties where he basically comes to terms with the fact of like, if I'm trying to represent people, I need to represent their struggles. And so he switches from an intellectual protagonist to a Bedouin protagonist um, and or broadly speaking, an indigenous protagonist. So from the environmental standpoint, the environmental causes that he takes up in Cities of Salt are still political and they still, um, they still relate to land, but in an ecological sense, you know, they're in defense of the flora and the fauna and the seasonal way that Bedouins um, and any type of nomad really designs and lives their life in service to the land, as opposed to say, you know, like a political, like a politician who is ta still talking about land, but we're talking about it in terms of territory and nationalism, et cetera. So from, from, the, from the ecological standpoint, what he does is he basically presents an entire community who is put in a trance because of this neoliberal colonial encounter that basically completely changed the topography of these oases that the Bedouin inhabited. Um, and that political conversation obviously is one that is kind of paramount to any country in the global South that has been completely transformed by the violence of colonialism and its extraction of the natural resources of indigenous peoples. But in terms of, you know, his more like, you know, in terms of like the question of oil, I, that, and I think that's where we have a little bit of, um, I don't want to say hypocrisy, but there's a bit of a conflict there, right? Because he's an oil economist who's also writing about indigeneity and is taking that position. Whereas, you know, I think it's really important to note that Bedouins don't live their lives knowing or caring what's underneath the soil, which is oil, but basically how to survive atop the land, you know? Um, now the question again of oil is interesting because I think he was acutely aware that this was going to happen anyway. So how, how can we seize this opportunity? And I'm speaking in his language, not, you know, we, the collective, we, um, in a way that, we use oil to modernize, to develop. This is kind of the system we've been given right now, you know, um, and it's not environmentally friendly, but how do we use that to liberate ourselves from the shackles and the aftermath of colonialism? And then perhaps invest in alternative forms of modernization and energy, but it has to be something that arises from, you know, um, basically uh, regional domestic ways of living and not basically this colonial framework that's superimposed onto, you know, a topography that isn't Europe, right? Like, the, you know, you can't say that it, what the desert is to Arab culture and folklore is basically what the forest is to Europe, right? So you can't say that this system, if I bring it and transplant it into the desert, it's gonna be exactly the same. Uh, so I think that was the question. I don't know if I'm making sense, but there were there were certain elements or certain facets to this argument that I think were really important um, and all yeah. kind of came together and we zoom in and we zoom out. So it's a multifaceted yeah. argument. Yeah, I mean, in many ways, it's, it's about capital, right? Accumulation yeah. of capital, because I wonder, you know, pearl diving isn't all that great for the for um, for, for the sort of sea life. Um, Cutting down cedar trees, um, you know, isn't isn't that great for forests? Like, in general, once you find a once you find good resources, business in interests as they are, try to try right. to sort of uh, be as efficient and, and sort of capitalize on all that stuff. So um, it's the status quo, right? It's operating within the system we've been yeah. given, and the only system we have right now is one that is dependent on fossil fuels.
So yeah, it was like, see, let's seize this opportunity and then maybe change the conversation at a later, later point when we have more capital sure. or more agency. Okay, I wanna talk about language real quick before we go to the thing, because I wanted to talk to you about a project that you have coming up that's focused on um, language about Palestine, of Palestine, written not in Arabic, and not exclusively about Palestine, but you're spending a lot of time thinking about uh, translation, register, and how to capture local, local voice and local stories maybe not in like native tongues. Is that, that right? Yeah, in a way, yes. Yeah, so walk me through what you're thinking of, what this project is, and then we'll move to the, the Q&A. Sure, so um, I saw this ad on Instagram like maybe a couple months ago and it said there's an anthology coming out about the question is, you know, broadly speaking, is it possible to decolonize the practice of translation? And I thought to myself, how is, you know, how could that even be possible? Because the first thing that came to my mind was, many of the novelists that you've showcased here on the screen, so many new Palestinian writing specifically as a diasporic community is coming out in English, some in Spanish, some in Hebrew. And so is it even possible to even begin to answer that question in the Palestinian context, specifically when half the population isn't even on the land and is growing up speaking a language that you know, that has, that is not their, you know, their quote unquote native tongue. They don't have access to Arabic in the same way. They can't write novels in Arabic. So I thought to myself, it's really interesting because in this, in this particular tradition, um, Susanna Bulhawa is like one of the first, I think, you know, to really publish a very successful novel in English about Palestine. And a lot of the work that's come out in the last 20 years kind of follows, follows that. Um, is it fair to say that they're not Palestinian enough because they're not writing in Arabic? And what is the role that English is playing specifically as the colonizer's language, as one of the colonizer's languages, right? Um, if we're constructing an idea and Palestine is surviving in these other languages. So that's their way of accessing you know, home is to be able to construct a new Palestine and help it to survive in English and in Hebrew and in Spanish, if you're talking about Chile, et cetera. So I'm kind of thinking about juxtaposing three different um, examples, one being the Arab um, Anglophone writing, one being the minor um, Palestinian writing in Hebrew with Amir Habibi and Sayyid Kashur, um, irrespective of what I think of one of those figures and what they write, um, they're writing in Hebrew. And, you know, then you have 500 Palestinians in Chile that are trying, that are still, you know, generations later, very much attached to their Palestinian identity. So I wonder sometimes if Palestine could be the, case, the, the central case study for this question of whether it's possible to decolonize translation as a native national indigenous literature, as well as a literature that is inherently in exile. Um, so, so just some of the things that, that are swimming around in my head, but I think it's, it's really interesting. Cool. Yeah. Um, when we had uh, Muna Karim on the program, we talked about translation and in particular like self-translation. And we had a really, really interesting conversation about that. Um, okay. Um, let's talk. I don't think we have time to talk about some of your other work. I wanted to talk to you about um, what seems to be a, a, a love of music and writing about it, but we... I don't think we'll have time. Maybe we'll have time at the end. Okay, so what are you reading or watching right now? Um, currently reading Italo Galfino's Invisible Cities. I really like to indulge in literature that isn't what I like write about for a living. So lots of Italian stuff right now. Not really watching anything at the moment. I tend to binge watch TV, so I try to avoid it until I can anymore. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah. Um, who would you love to shadow for a day, past or present? There are so many people, but I think um, there are two women that come to mind. Asya Jabbar, who I think it would be fascinating to just see how she constructed her day. And Fatima Bhutto, who's somebody that I really admire. And I love watching and, and every interview she's ever done. So I think it would just be great to, to learn from her and be in her presence. Uh, what do people most misunderstand about your work? I would imagine there's a long, uh, a long list, especially people who don't read it. 
<laughs> yeah, and there's a lot. I think people think that I try to be ethnocentric on purpose or choose topics that are, you know, because Abdurrahman Munif was Saudi and Iraqi, but he wrote like a Palestinian and he wrote like a Syrian, like, and he was socialized as a Jordanian. So he's still very much part of my, my real life world. But I don't try to do that. I'm just really attracted to things that are about people who resist and are in exile. And so that tends to be the same type of work. But it, you know, it's all part of you know, trying to be anti-colonial and anti-imperial in my daily life and finding things that nourish me um, that I can explore. I'm sure there's a long list, of course. But if there is a one or two that you want to give a shout out to, whose work do you admire or are inspired by? Oh, this is such a cliche, but obviously Edward Said um, and Fanon and Césaire and, you know, that, you know, nucleus of um, sort of the, what we know now as post-colonial studies, the, you know, the types of, those types of writers, that generation of work, I think still inspires me, even though we're moving beyond it, but, or, you know, engaging with it in different ways, but it's still the thing that really set the, set the spark for me. So definitely those. Okay, um, our first question is from Annalise. Hi, Mike. <laughs> Hi, Suja. You know, uh, frankly, I think my question may have been answered. I'm not sure. Um, just basically, uh, just I ask you to elaborate on why I'm American living in Poland, actually, but I lived in Beirut for two years as well. Um, and just why you didn't think this author's um, works were particularly pal palliative to the to the Western reader, um, to, to the palate of the Western reader, sorry. And uh, you may have answered my question as far as like the, the colonialism, um, given the, you, that your uh, Palestinian heritage living in the US, you know, I kind of, I think that's shaping up for me, but is there anything else that you would like to say about that? Because again, I'm sorry, I've, I've heard of quite a few of the authors um, and I had not heard about him. So of course I'm gonna go out and buy these two. Um, but I just wanted to know if you could elaborate a little bit or if your sure. question's been answered. Thank you so much. No, no, there was something I forgot to mention. Um, I obviously chose him because he writes about the entire region and I thought, wow, I can study the, the whole Arab world with this one man's corpus. And I don't think I really emphasize that enough. He wrote about Syria, Iraq, uh, Saudi. Uh, so he, he's one of the few people to bridge the gap between the Arab Mediterranean and the Arab Gulf, which is why I chose him. And I, I did not emphasize that enough. Um, but one of the things that really kind of, I think impacted his readership specifically here in the United States was that John Updike uh, published a review of Cities of Salt um, and in the New Yorker. And he said that this was nothing like a novel and that Munif should be ashamed of himself essentially because all he's done is basically taking the voice of a campfire explainer and try to put it into this very convoluted um, way of writing about basically how much uh, Bedouins suffered with the rise of the oil industry. But the irony of that statement is that, of course, that's exactly what he tried to do because Cities of Salt basically attempts to construct a novel um, that is at once local and global so that it, no one could say that it's not a novel, but you would also say that um, it borrows heavily from the Bedouin oral tradition and the storytelling kind of um, tradition established by the Arabian Nights. So he wanted the narratology to resemble something that Arab readers would find familiar, but that the overall body of the work, at the end of the day, you could say, okay, this is a novel in a series. Um, and so the thing that Updike uh, criticized was actually the whole point of this exercise is how do you construct a local novel that is true to Arab heritage and at the same time can compete on the global stage. I just think people weren't ready for something that looked different. And that's not to say that these, this, these books weren't successful. They just, I think, were met at a time where there was a lot of hostility, specific, specifically around um, the themes in which it treats. Thanks, Annalise. OK, uh, Catherine asked me to ask her question. She says, one of Munif's most brilliant works is the first Shad uh, al-Mutawasit. But as it's known, as I know, it's only been translated into French. It's an extraordinary account of political imprisonment. Do you know if it's being or has been translated into English? 
Yes, Sharkan Mutawasit is an amazing, actually there's two of them. Um, and they're, they, you know, they are essential prison fiction, not because they were written in, uh, in prison, but because they represent the torture and um, the experience of people who have been imprisoned. I have no knowledge of them being translated into English, unfortunately. I think that they do exist in Russian and French. Um, but it's a shame because there's a lot, again, you know, he was so transgeneric. He wrote about the desert. He wrote about the Mediterranean. He wrote about war. He wrote about prison. There's so many things that he, that he wrote about intellectuals and their plight about Palestine. There's so many things that he tried to do um, in his career. And so much of that is going to be lost to people who can't read in Arabic. But, um, you know, I think if you can read French and you can read Spanish and Italian, there are some of those works translated into those languages if you can't read in Arabic. Okay, I have one last question before we end. How does he avoid the, the sort of the, the pothole um, or the trap of making the native population this idyllic nostalgic thing? Um, because he's talking about a lot of different places and it's hard to know a lot of different places intimately. Um, yeah. how, how does he avoid that? Well, you know, it's interesting because I think a lot of people forget that he's, he's trying to um, excavate all of this from a reservoir of trauma and exile. And a lot of times, if you look at the work, anything he's ever written about is basically founded in his own experience. So the irony of his situation is that he, he was a Bedouin and he was an intellectual, right? And he was exilic also in this modern nomadic sense. He was just trying to represent things authentically. Everything that he's written is very much steeped in research. Uh, there was a great deal. Um, it, he wasn't just representing from off the top of his head. He was actually, you know, trying to capture the essence of the real people that he was trying to represent. So, I mean, obviously there's a trap of nostalgia and, you know, there's always the question of what could have been and what that means, but I do think that one of the things that he's done accurately is that if you were to read uh, basically Aramco's records of how they established, you know, the reservoirs in, in the Arabian Peninsula and his and his and cities of salt, for example, it's almost exactly the same history, but on the inverse from the social people's perspective. So it's really steeped in a lot of historical research. Okay, great. Sergio, thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And sorry, my internet, uh, my uh, power cut out halfway through the thing. <laughs> oh, wow. I just noticed. I'm Beirut for you. Okay, everybody. Um, enjoy your evening. Great to see you all here. Glad you enjoyed it. And uh, we will see you next week. <laughs>